evening. I've been talking about Peter, and I'm going to continue that this evening. It's been quite an interesting study for me. I hope it has been for you. There's a start slide for that down there somewhere. Huh? I called him Peter of the Threes because there's a lot of threes in Peter's life, isn't there? The Apostle of the Three, I called him. I think that's... Uh, there's a lot of threes in him. The three denials, the three times Jesus says, do you love me? Um, you know, three was kind of a big number in the life of, of Peter. Um, you know, in John 21, as in this course, John's gospel, and, and he was talking about, a lot of people think this is prophesying about the death of Peter. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wish. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this he said signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. So Jesus was looking ahead to Peter's death. Um, you'll, somebody will take you and lead you to a place that you don't wish to go. You know, but then Peter, I think probably the biggest thing we think, you know, in Matthew 16, Jesus gave Peter the keys of the kingdom. You know, I give you the keys to the kingdom. And he did use those keys. And Peter opened the kingdom to, to the Jews on the day of Pentecost and to the household of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 to the, to the Gentiles about three and a half years or four years after the crucifixion of Christ. So Peter's the one who brought that to the Gentiles. Peter had the vision of the sheets. We'll talk about that a little bit. And, you know, he should have understood more than any. Peter in Acts, you know, it says Acts of the Apostles, but Acts is really about two apostles predominantly, Peter and Paul. The first part of Acts with Peter, the second part of Acts deals with Paul. And as you look at those, uh, some of the big things that Peter did in Acts, well, of course, he had these two great sermons in Acts, Acts chapter 2, and then his other sermon, Acts chapter 3, he had his two great sermons. He had uh, the healing of the lame beggar in Acts 3. And that was a significant event, thrown into prison uh, after that event. Peter and John in prison uh, escaped, released, miraculously released. Uh, they were afraid to rearrest him because of the crowds. Peter's popularity was growing. Peter was becoming a leader in the church in Jerusalem. And that's a position that he would not necessarily hold, per se, because of his other evangelistic opportunities. You read through Acts. Uh, James the Just, who would be James the Lord's brother, James the Just kind of becomes a predominant apostle in Acts. If you look at the Jerusalem Council in the book of Acts, it's James who appears to kind of be taking that role in, in uh, Jerusalem, kind of like the main one in Jerusalem that people are going to. But Peter at this time is big. Uh, Ananias and Sapphira, the, the gifts they gave, uh, Peter coming to Peter, laying in Peter, accusing them, why do you lie to the Holy Spirit? the death of Ananias and Sapphira, Peter's shadow, you know, laying people down, so even the shadow of Peter as he passed would heal them, the healing of just, just his shadow casting over them, which is, you know, that's an amazing thing. Sometimes they don't look at it in the book of Acts, but just his shadow falling on them, they would be healed. So th that kind of gives you an idea of, of Peter, his miraculous release from prison in, uh, in Acts 5. Um, Peter heals the bedridden, the raising of Tabitha, uh, the raising of the dead, you know, Peter's one of those ones who actually did that. That's very limited in scope in, in the Bible, at least that we have recorded. So that was a significant event in his uh, life. Acts chapter 12, the Philippian jailer released from prison. Story of the Philippian jailer. So Peter was instrumental in that also. So there's, uh, you know, Peter was kind of in the beginning of Acts. You kind of see his story. A lot of went on early in the book of Acts related to Peter. So that's kind of a... A uh, kind of a glimpse of that, um, the record of that. I think one of the most interesting things about Peter is to do with the church in Antioch. Peter spent some time in Antioch, we believe, the church in Antioch. That would be Pisidian Antioch where Paul left on his missionary journeys. And in Galatians uh, 2, Paul accuses him, stands face to face and condemns him, more than accuses him, condemns him because he was associating with the Jews. This is a real significant turning point. Not only in Peter, I think Peter's ministry, but in Paul's ministry. And it's kind of hard to, to study it all out and to kind of get it in perspective. But, but it was a real turning point with those two. Uh, it was significant that Paul would stand up and condemn Peter. 
Peter who had had the vision uh, coming down out of heaven that everything's unclean. And yet here he says, when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. This would be James, the Lord's brother. There's a lot of controversy about, well, not really controversy, but speculation about that. James in Jerusalem, the Lord's brother in Jerusalem, and how he was very Jewish-oriented, and how Paul, on the other hand, was kind of going away from that. He was very Gentile-oriented. And a lot of people think Peter kind of became the bridge between James and Paul. And, and kind of became that spokesman between them, that mediating force. James being really on the side of a Jewish, uh, you see that in the Jerusalem Council, really on the side of the Jewish customs and Jewish traditions, and you need to be circumcised, you need to do Jewish things, even though you're a Christian. Paul, on the other hand, the opposite of that, Paul saying, no, you're Gentiles, you know the law of Christ, you know, you're under the law of Christ, you're not under the law of Moses, circumcision doesn't mean anything. Uh, meat uh, sacrificed to idols doesn't mean anything. And there was, a, there was this opposing view, and then Peter is kind of in the middle, it seems. Peter having carried the gospel to the Gentiles, to the household of Cornelius, Peter having seen the vision, and yet here Peter uh, associating once again with the Jews and not the Gentiles at these meals. And Paul condemning him, um, says he held himself aloft, even taking Barnabas with him. He joined the rest of the Jews in the hypocrisy. Result, even Barnabas was carried away, which that had really hurt Paul. Because if you remember right, Paul and Barnabas went on the first missionary journey together. And then on the second missionary journey, uh, Barnabas took John Mark. Paul took Silas because John had deserted him on the first one. But Paul and Barnabas had a real relationship. Barnabas is the one that went and got Paul, brought him back to Antioch. Went to and, and so you know Barnabas was instrumental in that. Barnabas is the one who introduced Paul in Jerusalem after his conversion. So Barnabas and Paul had a really close relationship, and yet even Barnabas was carried away by the hypocrisy. It says uh, doing that. It says when I saw they were not straightforward the truth, I said to Cephas, "Is the presence of all? If you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews?" So. The condemnation of, of Peter by Paul, really a big turning point uh, in the early church. And I think a big turning point in these two and the relationship that these two had. It's really, really a significant time. Um, and I think it's really interesting to me, fascinating that Paul would have the ability, the courage to stand up and oppose Peter, who was kind of the pillar of the church, you know, the, uh, as you would see it, oppose Peter to his face and say, you're wrong. You stand condemned because of the things that you've done. I think Peter came around, and you know, Second Peter's a disputed book, pretty well. Uh, did Peter actually write it? Was a, you know, maybe not. A lot of scholars don't think Peter wrote Second Peter. I don't think there's any proof that says he didn't. So I don't know how you, I don't know how. I don't want to get into that argument, but I'm just going to leave it where it is. Uh, second Peter, uh, in Second Peter three, it says, and this is the only time in the Bible that another apostle or a new testament writing is particularly referred to is saying listen to this listen to what paul said so it's really a powerful passage that way uh giving credibility to the writings of paul and i think maybe you can read into this depending on how you take second peter you can read into this that peter and paul reconciled and that's what i would hope i would hope that peter and paul reconciled it's interesting, Peter and Paul are going to die at basically the same time, by the same hand, Nero, in the same place, Rome. Peter and Paul are both being mart martyred at essentially the same time in history. Uh, but Peter says, in regard to the patience of our Lord of salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, probably referring to 1 Corinthians here, or 1 Thessalonians. A lot of people think referring to 1 Thessalonians 4, specifically. Um, also in his letter, speaking in them of these things, which are sometimes hard to understand, which the untaught or unstable distort. I would like to think this is 1 Thessalonians 4, because I still think that the untaught and the unstable distort 1 Thessalonians 4, so I'd like to think that's what it's talking about here. It says, uh, as they do the rest of the scriptures, to their own destruction. But it's an interesting passage. I hope that it means that Peter and Paul reconciled, that Peter and Paul worked it out, that it all was good? We don't know. We really don't know the answer to the question. How did Peter respond when Paul condemned him to his face? We really don't know. Did Peter respond, repent, change his ways? Did Peter 
stand back and yell at Paul. I, I don't have the answer to the question. But hopefully this gives us a little insight that maybe, maybe they were reconciled uh, eventually. First and second Peter, the two epistles that Peter wrote are that are attested to him in the New Testament. First Peter, he, he calls himself by name, says, I wrote it, Peter wrote it. A lot of controversy about these when they were written. Uh, first Peter calls Rome Babylon, or says Babylon, which we know is referring to Rome. And that makes some people think it was written later than Peter lived. More than I can go into tonight. A lot of speculation. You're welcome to look at that for yourself. I kind of just leave it where it is. I think I'm all right with it where it is. You know, the legend, I think this is pretty interesting. Uh, Quo Vadis. Um, Peter fleeing um, Rome, the story, as the story goes, as the story goes. Peter, Nero, Rome burns, 64, right, A.D. Rome burns, you've heard the story. Rome, Nero fiddled, why Rome burned, right, as the saying goes. Rome burns. Nero blames Christians because they're easy to blame. Uh, as the story goes, Peter is fleeing Rome to avoid his martyrdom under the hands of Nero. And on the way, he meets Jesus, a risen Jesus. And Jesus says in the Latin, Quo Vadis, um, where are you going? He says, uh, going to Rome to be crucified again. Peter then gains courage to continue his ministry and returns to the city where, as legend has it, he's martyred by being crucified upside down because he refused to be crucified the same way as the Lord. Uh, Jerome, if you, we looked at Jerome a little bit, and Jerome says he was crucified with his feet towards the sky. So uh, Peter crucified upside down about the same time, probably at maybe at exactly the same instant, the same time in history that Paul was beheaded because this was a Roman festival. It was held in the circus of the emperor, the circus of the emperor of Rome because everything else in Rome had been destroyed by the fire. And Christians were, there was a lot of bloodshed. And Christians were burned and crucified and beheaded. And Paul and Peter were two of those guys. And so Peter, as legend goes, was crucified upside down. The church of Domine Quo Vetus in Rome was built where the meeting towards Peter and Jesus allegedly took place. So Peter was fleeing, according to the story. Met Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, going on the road. And Jesus persuaded him by these words to turn around and go back to Rome, where Peter would subsequently be executed. He was crucified upside down by Nero in 64 AD. Yes, we're pretty sure about that. Pretty sure about that. He was, uh, tradition still locates his burial place under the Basilica of St. Peter, under, directly beneath Basilica's high altar. Now, that's kind of an interesting story because they wanted to build, at that time, Constantine comes into power, right? Constantine is the Christian emperor, the one who sees the, his armies fighting under the Gilded Cross and decides Christianity is going to be the religion of Rome. Constantine uh, is responsible largely for the Bible. You hold here, whether or not, another story. Um, Council of Nice, 325 A.D., that was Constantine. And he... Um, he started building these basilicas over these places of Christian tradition. And they wanted this built directly over, supposedly, the tomb of Peter. So because of that, instead of building it just to the side where it would have been flat, they had to excavate this entire mountain and to build this basilica right exactly where it was. And there were other, some other cemeteries there that had a little bit of controversy, but they built this apparently, supposedly, right over the tomb. Of, uh, of Peter in Rome. Also, the footprints, interesting legend, the footprints of Jesus meeting Peter, where, Jesus, where Peter met Jesus on the road, apparently the footprints of Jesus are preserved in the, uh, in the church of Domine Quo Vatis. So that's another legend. True, maybe not, maybe true, maybe not true, but interesting, needless to say. 
So, also, the skull of St. Peter is claimed to reside in the Archbasilica of St. John Lateran since at least the 9th century, alongside the skull of St. Paul. Also, the filings of the chains that held Peter in prison were also sent by a pope to another king somewhere. can't remember where that was. Actually, Constantinople, right? Because he was trying to reconcile, and some bone fragments were sent to the Greek Orthodox Church by a pope to try to reconcile a little bit between Western Catholicism and the Eastern Orthodox. But the supposedly the bulk of the remains of Peter are still in his tomb beneath the Basilica, uh, St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. So that's kind of where those reside. So that picture on this side is supposedly, I've never been there, going to Rome. Maybe I'll get to see it. Uh, that's apparently is the tomb of St. Peter in St. Peter's Basilica underneath that arch is supposedly where his tomb is. And that's kind of a fuzzy picture of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. So that supposedly is where Peter has been laid to rest. And uh, supposedly that's where his relics are. Uh, interesting character. We could probably spend weeks and weeks on Peter, essentially, if we chose to. I'll try not to take that long on, on each character I look at. But I hope you find some of this interesting. I certainly do. Uh, Peter was a different guy, wasn't he? Uh, a lot of history, a lot of legend, a lot of what we see in the church today resides or cir circulates around Peter and what he did as an apostle and what the Lord commissioned him to do as an apostle. So it's kind of, he's kind of an interesting guy, isn't he? Appreciate your time this evening. If we can help you in any way, won't you let it be known while we stay?